during the design of a control systems, one of the things that we're going to do is solve the resulting differential equation. We want to do this iterative. Well, it becomes very cumbersome. And so instead of solving for the actual solution, what we want to do is be able to characterize the solution. That'll give us the ability to look at some simple parameters in a differential equation and characterize how the response will be. Now, we won't get the exact response, but we can say something about the response. And by doing that, we'll be able to design based on these characteristics. The response of a differential equation due to an input can be broken into two parts. One is the transient response. The other is the steady state response or the forced response. We are going to be looking at the transient response. We'll deal with the steady state response later. The transient response is characterized by the poles of the system. The poles of the system, which are the roots of the characteristic equation. So a quick reminder, given a differential equation of a form, this x double dot plus 2x dot plus 5x is equal to some function of time. f is the forcing function. We are interested in the characteristic equation for this system. You take the differential equation and replace the powers with a variable we're using lambda. Lambda squared plus 2 lambda plus 5 equals 0. So this is now the homogeneous equation. Homogeneous means the forcing function is set equal to 0. And we solve for the roots of that. Find roots, lambda 1, lambda 2. Those are the poles of the system. Given the poles of the system, we know that the transient response, x of t transient, will have the form a1 e to the lambda 1 t plus a2 e to the lambda 2 t plus and so on for lambdas where lambda may be complex that is lambda could have the form lambda is equal to a plus b i then we have that e to the lambda t becomes e to the a plus b i t, which is equal to e to the a t, e to the b i t. And this right here, we can write in terms of sines and cosines using the Euler's identity. And so we have e to the a t times the quantity cosine b t plus i sine of b t. And now time for a little hand waving. If our system is real, we know that we'll not have complex transient response. This right here is a tra complex transient response. We have the imaginary value i. If it's real, then the roots are going to come in complex conjugate pairs. That means that we will have one set here, a plus bi, one set here, lambda is equal to a minus bi. We're going to add those two together. And for real systems, the imaginary parts will cancel out because of the coefficients. Again, a little bit of hand waving. You can go back to your differential equations text and read up on that if you need convincing. The end result is that for complex roots, that is complex poles of a system, the solution is going to have the form e to the at times the quantity a cosine bt plus b sine of bt. Or we could write this as a cosine of b plus bt plus v. So the frequency is b with some phase shift. Let's put this all together again. Given roots of the characteristic equation, that is the poles of a system, the transient response will be characterized as following. You will have the form x is equal to some combination of a e to the lambda 1 t for real lambda plus a 2 e to the a t cosine b t plus phi for complex lambda. If lambda is real, then we have when lambda is less than zero, the system decays. And you can see because lambda is less than zero, we have something e to the minus value t. As t gets larger, we have e to a minus increasingly larger number, which approaches zero. Lambda is equal to zero. 
no decay. Lambda is greater than zero. System grows. This is unstable. It means that over time, the system, the output of the system grows exponentially with time. If lambda is equal to a plus bi, then we have a similar case. If a is less than zero, then the response looks like e to the a t cosine of b t plus v. a is less than zero, system decays. Just as we had here, that's because cosine just varies between zero, minus one, and plus one. This is a multiplier in front of it, so it's essentially scaling this value. So as this value gets smaller and smaller, the whole value gets smaller and smaller. Similarly, if a is equal to zero, pure oscillation. If a is greater than zero, system grows. An easy way to visualize this is to plot the roots of lambda on the complex plane. And this is something we're going to do a lot. So I'm going to draw a complex plane. This is the real axis. This is the imaginary axis. If we're given a value of lambda right here, that corresponds to a negative real value. And so the system response, negative real, has some sort of decaying exponential. If I have a value out here, then the absolute value is larger. And so if we characterize the response of that, it's going to decay, but it's going to decay faster. If we go the other direction and we look at systems here, now we have a real root. Real root is going to grow exponentially. Larger absolute value, real root grows faster. So you can see if we look at the real part of the pole for a system, it tells us how fast the system is going to grow. Now let's look and see what happens when we have pure imaginary parts. If we have a system right here, then the solution is going to be A, then the solution is going to be, let's go back up and look at it, E to the 0t, that's 1, cosine of bt. So there's no decay, all we have is pure oscillation. So it looks something like this. And as we go for larger imaginary values, we have a faster oscillation. Let's look and see what happens when we take a value that has both real and imaginary parts. The system decays at this rate, and it oscillates at that rate. The system is going to decay at this rate and oscillate at that rate. So we'll sketch that in. So here's the decay rate. That's supposed to match that value right here. And then the oscillation rate fits right inside. If I pick something over here, the decay rate is going to match this, that decay rate, and the oscillation rate is that. So it'll do something like this. So what you can see is that if the system is on this side, it's stable. If it's on this side, it's unstable. If it's right in the middle, it just oscillates. As we move up and down, when you go this direction, or this direction, you get faster oscillations. And so now we can take a differential equation, find the poles of the system. This is just algebra finding the roots of a, and finding the roots of a polynomial. We don't have to solve the differential equation. And we can characterize the transient response of the system by looking at the poles of the system. If the poles of the system have a negative real part, the system will be stable. The transient response will be stable. If they're positive, it'll have a exponentially growing or unstable transient response. If the real part is zero, the system will just oscillate without growing or decaying. We can also say something about the oscillations based on the imaginary part. The frequency of oscillation corresponds to the value of the imaginary part. Again, this lets us characterize the solution to the transient response of a differential equation without actually having to solve the differential equation. All we have to do is find the roots of a polynomial.